Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, but I uh, appreciate everybody hopping on for, for the webinar today. And this one was you know, a 2023 recap uh, of some of our favorite talks and, you know, why they're our favorite talks and, you know, obviously give some credit to and kudos to the research that went into that and, and kind of the inspiration that a lot of these folks give us uh, in our own capabilities and our teams that we're able to leverage, you know, every day uh, to help defend customers in a better way. And so this is kind of a recap of, of 2023. Uh, I know that I was on the speaker circuit uh, quite a bit on 2023. I made, uh, uh, was it Premier 1K again, the highest level you can make it in, in United, unfortunately. So I hopefully don't get to make that again this year. But uh, I am going to be speaking at Hackspace Con, uh, which is out in Florida, which is pretty cool. It's at the actually at the the aerospace uh, facility, which is which is pretty neat uh, here coming up. But um, lots of good talks in 2023. Uh, some of my memorable conferences like Wild West Hack and Fest and, you know, Black Hat and DEF CON, some just really good conferences being put on um, out there that, you know, uh, are, are near and dear to my heart. So, you know, with that, I'll kick it off. So first I'll introduce, you know, Justin. Justin, good to see you, man. And uh, maybe give an introduction to yourself and, you know, kick it off a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, yep. Uh, so Justin Elsey, um, CTO at Trusted Sec, um, kind of over the red team and research practice uh, at a high level. Um, and just love all things offense. Jason? Jason Lang, practice lead of uh, the target operations team. And uh, also love all things offense. And watched, watched a lot of talks. It's going to be it's gonna be fun. I'm going to be really interested to see what you guys line up with in terms of what what talks you liked, but really more importantly, why you like them. What what do you guys think makes for a good talk? What do you think makes for a great talk? You know, I, you have like a Rubik's cube, don't you? you have like different ratings that you you you've made this overly complex, haven't you? No, no. What what are you talking about? That's what Elsie said. Elsie said you had like this there, grading sheet. All right, there was so an acronym. I, I actually do have an acronym, but that's all besides the point. I'm really <laughs> interested in what you guys think. <laughs> Listen, what? I, you know, I actually so so full disclosure. I actually have a tough time sitting through talks for some reason, um, and I and I don't know why. I I always have since I started in the industry, and it's very difficult for me unless it's like a buddy or a friend to actually sit through a talk. But I, I will say that there was. Definitely some captivating uh, talks this year. And I think what what I prefer from a talk is stories. Like, you know, yeah. it, let's just say it's a, a new tool. Well, how did you come up with the idea for the tool? How did you develop the tool? And, and how did you get to, to point A to point B and, and the steps that you took to get there so that I can start to rack my brain around how I would I would conceptually do something like that to actually learn off of it, right? Or if it's... Uh, you know, a righteous hack they did or something, you know, what, what, what started you off and, and what are the stories in between? What are some funny things that you can influx into there? Some, some areas that, that stumped you that, that you couldn't get over and to overcome, you know, like, like those are the types of, of, I like, I think gripping and exciting talks that I really enjoy because, you know, they, they paint a narrative around, it, it lets your mind go wild with, with that person, you know, sitting in, in their room, developing cool stuff and how they figured it out, how their mind went to a different place that, you know, somebody else didn't to, to come to that new new conclusion. And, you know, those are the ones that that I think I enjoy sitting through because it's not, you know, a uh, a dictionary of terms that I'm going through or, you know, just seeing a lot of code strung through that I don't don't really have time to dissect and go through in the first place. You know, I can do that after the talk. You know, it's it's really uh, something that, that that needs to captivate me from a story perspective. I don't know about you guys. Definitely the uh, watching people fail, right? You watch a talk, 30, 40 minutes of how they did something awesome. And you're like, oh, they're, you know, I, I feel dumb. And they're like, oh, they did this and whatever. But them showing the timeline of what it took to get there, I think is huge for me because it's like some of the smartest people I know failed a bunch to get to the talk. That's shirt, by the way. That, that shirt's awesome. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I would say for me, the... Uh, um, Dave, you you actually hit the first one, which is which is story. I the stories make the talk. They they just do, and and it's I I say that carefully because I I know that people put out you know a lot of really really good research and a lot of really good content and a lot of time and thought and effort goes into that process. When it comes time to get up on stage and actually present that material, even just one or two well placed stories when they get linked together that way, that's what makes it just really memorable. Uh, to me and and I my my favorite speakers are the ones that are also the best storytellers you yeah. know when they could be and and that's just I I I love that part I'm I'm also huge into practicality 
Um, and it's not to say I don't like research. I, I do like research, but I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to give a talk, that's like, you know, really theoretical and in that, you know, upper end of the the research area, bring it back to practicality in some way, shape or form, whether that's with a chunk of code or tie it back to methodology or something that makes it practical for the listener that has, that will probably never go to the, the depth that you went to in your yeah. research phase. So th those are a couple of mine, but well, and there's also that, you know, I remember when I used to give some of my talks, I, I would obviously do like stupid things like have chickens dancing on stage and, you know, uh, you know, have have shells ring in the background when I'm playing heavy metal music and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It was the entertainment factor that I remembered yeah. from yeah. when when I was growing up with like CDC, you know, like they called Dead Cow and, and Loft and those guys would all get up on stage. And it was just like this show and guitars and, you know, things like that. I'm not saying it needs to be that way today, but, you know, at the same time, you know, you're up there as an entertainer, essentially. Um mm -hmm. And you're, you're essentially trying to sell the audience in what you did is cool, right? Yep. And that's hard to do when you're like, well, hey, I found this, you know, ASLR bypass and did this and all of this. And, you know, all of a sudden I got this and all of a sudden there's this code on the screen and then you all of a sudden you get a shell, right? You know, 90% of the audience isn't going to understand what you did, uh, you know, and and so you have to kind of tell a story around why it's important uh, and, and lead up to it, right? Um, and, and a lot of the talks that we see today aren't necessarily like zero day new technique related some of them are conceptual around you know new new things around um you know uh maybe new techniques or new law bins or you know new ways of looking at ai and ml and how that's gonna you know incorporate more conceptual strategy things right you know the story is still extremely important in all those scenarios because you know what can somebody take out of a talk uh that they can apply to their real day life if it's just this you know, hypothetical, great, you know, great world where someday, you know, robots are going to secure everything. Well, you know, someone's gonna leave that talk with like, what the hell did I just watch? Right. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you're able to like walk out with some key things that you can do in your environment, a new way of, of defending maybe or a new TTP out there that, you know, is important to you, and you have a, a script that actually you can run and you can, you know, you don't even spend a lot of time on the script that yeah. just, hey, it's out available my GitHub, but here's what it does. And here's the cool stuff. And here's why it's applicable to you and what you need to focus on from a defending perspective. And one of the talks I want to get into, you know, first and foremost, just right out of the gate, um, is is the one that Paul Berkland did at, at DEF CON because, you know, to me, and, and obviously I have bias because you know Paul works works here at, at Trusted Sec, but you know it was probably one of the the best talks at that probably it, from what I saw it was the best talk at DEF CON as far as the research, the implications, the storytelling. And we sanitize the living hell of that thing too. I mean, like it, it went through like 15 different iterations and legal. And I mean, cause it was, it was real touchy, real saucy. And we definitely pissed off a lot of people during that one. Um, but, but at the same time, it was the right thing to do. And, you know, things got fixed. Right. But what I was surprised on was it didn't get as much attention as I used to see a lot of the other talks, you know, at DEF CON that were that same type of caliber previously in the past. Right. You know, Usually, you'd make the news, or you know, uh, a lot of folks would be talking about it on podcasts, or the research would be expanded upon and taken upon, and you know, different things. You know, there was a tool release, there was POCs and code, you know, how to replicate it, what the impact was, which was extremely substantial. And again, we only released a small sliver of what was actually yeah. possible because yeah, yeah. we don't want to break the internet. But uh, you know, and Paul did an amazing job at at, at balancing that. Um, but you know, I was really surprised that you know based on the talk, it was a great talk. And maybe it was a scheduling or maybe because Def kind of so big now. I don't know. But it didn't seem like it got the traction like a lot of the normal talks do. And I really actually haven't seen that lately yeah. from a lot of the talks with some great research. So this is why this this whole webinar exists is to talk through some of the most amazing talks of the year that really didn't get the highlights that they probably should have for some amazing research, amazing storytelling, ways that they presented and things that impacted us that we could take back here and use you know, every day at trust attack or binary defense or whatever, you know, company you're in. So I, I just, I, I thought it was kind of weird that it didn't get the level of, of, of notoriety that you typically see in previous past ones. Like I, like I've done in the past before, like I know when I did, you know, talks before in the past, you know, I, I released a new, you know, new, new tool or new way of exploiting something. It'd be huge, right. It'd be on the news and all this other stuff. And you just don't see that anymore. That's interesting because they're the, the con scene has changed dramatically, I, I would say in the last few years. And I mean, with every talk being recorded now, you know, I, I have questions about things like, you know, how many people are actually attending conferences and stuff like that versus just watching them on YouTube. And, uh, you know, the, Paul's talk, uh, back to your point about, about Paul's talk, Paul's talk was great. 
And, you know, watching through that, you know, he had all of the elements that that go into making a really good talk. Like you said, the story, the practicality, funny, joking, yeah, funny. You know, nostalgia, yeah, yeah. you know, all yeah. that stuff. Right. The stuff that I, I look for in a talk. I, I enjoy it. Well, and there and there there has to be an element. And because you you hit on that point, which is really important, which is an element of I can't think of a better word other than showmanship. So like a little bit of entertaining, a little bit, you know, like a lot of enthusiasm that goes right. with it. So um, I, I I have a talk that I'll, I'll say for the end, which I thought hit all of the wow factors for me. Um, the one that that I thought was great offensive wise, I have some mind broken up like offense, defense and practicality and stuff like that. So offense, um, the one that I thought uh, was was really good in terms of good practical code, um, you know, uh, payload uh, dev, uh, which is a specialty that was I. I'm, I'm probably going to get his name wrong, so I'm sorry if you're watching this. Marius uh, Banak, um, he goes by M Geeky on Twitter. He did a talk at ZeefCon this last year called uh, Desperate Infection Chains. And and by the way, um, these are getting released. Um, uh, I might have to have somebody from from TS uh, describe where that's going to happen. But um, well, we have we have the YouTube links and all that kind of stuff for the things that we're recommending. So we'll we'll get that out to everyone. Um, but he gave a talk that was it it went into really cool um uh infection chains because he he basically opened the talk by saying things like the days are essentially gone I mean, they're not necessarily gone they're, they're basically gone when you can just like fire a single payload a single email single payload into uh or out, out to your target and get a shell and now it's like multiple stage payloads um and he broke down html smuggling dropping an iso the iso is a link plus a dnl or a D dll and the, the lnk file runs run deal i mean like went into like these really, really neat attack chains and gave tooling and um, examples about how this stuff works. So that as much as on one hand, I hate, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, like get, right? he, he's really, really good at describing really good red team trade craft. And I hate it love at the same time. Cause I'm like, don't say that. And then he says it, I'm like, Oh, but it's so cool. And it, it's, it's a complicated emotion, but yeah, that, that talk was, was really, really good. So that, that was EveCon last year. Aussie? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so I actually, I was thinking about this when I said I all things offense. I, I think most of these talks are actually not offense and defense uh, just because I think it's good to see where things are going as an attacker. So the first one I picked was uh, Casey's sub T's um, talk on building canary tokens for monitoring Windows process execution. Um, just because he walks through the route of, you know, how viable um, canaries are, it's kind of a different way to go after um Finding attackers, you know, we're used to building a detection, uh, just getting a response to it, but these are often much higher fidelity. Um, you know, we kind of walk through the uh, the process of engineering versus research, how, you know, you have a great research idea, but, you know, the practicalities of making it usable is, you know, kind of a separate piece. Um, you know, using things like DNS to signal back that a command got run. So from the red team side, like we always like using DNS for out of band signaling. So it's a nice merger of using, you know, something that's on offense, something in defense and, and building some really viable detections with it. Um, I think, you know, Jason and I talk about this, but, you know, canaries and documents and things that we can't necessarily understand ahead of time is the one thing that will always trip us up, right? We try to understand detections and work around them, but, um, you know, something like an AWS key that we can't validate, uh, things like that. Like we've done some work around pulling canary tokens out of office documents and such, but um, once you start, the next iteration, like the second level of canary tokens, um, just great ways to trip up attackers. Yeah, and and the defensive ones, especially like on deception, is is a relative. I would say relatively scarce in our industry. I don't understand why deception hasn't taken off as much either. Um, you know, from a attacker's perspective, and and Jason, you know, feel free to, to to disagree, but I mean, it's difficult sometimes to determine what's real and what's not, especially when you're dealing with you know, deception, but you probably don't run into it often because it's not really that well adopted across the board. And, you know, that's one of the things where you talk about layers of defense, you know, that's that's really one of your last lines of defense you want ever going off in your environment, because that means they've gotten rid of all, you know, got around all of your protection, got around all of your detection, and now you have deception capabilities put into place. And now those are like your last lines of defense, hoping that they trip up on some landmines that you, you know, planted in your environment. And, you know, I think the the biggest challenge is that, you know, at least why I, at least I firmly believe why deception probably hasn't taken off is that everybody's still really struggling with the detection engineering process and getting good detections in place, especially as new things are coming out all the time. That you know, the last thing they want to deal with is having to deploy, you know, canary tokens in 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 AWS and Azure or Antra, or you know, uh, be able to implement that in their own environment. So I think 
you know, um, there is a, a a big gap because we're so far behind in many areas. And I think a lot, especially like the, the medium business side of the house, mm-hmm. you know, really struggle with getting more detections in than, than kind of the commodity ones that you get from a traditional EDR or things like that. Yeah, I, like I'm the just response to the deception piece. And it, it's, I, I've told a, a lot of my clients this. I was like, my my nightmare is if you can make my tools lie to me. If you can give me a response back where something something isn't correct or I think something is correct, but it's really not. And that's that's just, those are things that keep me up at night as an attacker. And so, you know, it's, I, we're slowly starting to see that where it's like, uh, you know, so for example, uh, service accounts that are, you know, honey service accounts that have uh, service principal names associated to them for a Kerberos attack. You know, a client will do things like add one and I'm like, add 500 of them, you know, and make them realistic, you know, like put tripwires everywhere because nobody's ever going to use those kinds of accounts. And so if they, if anybody uses them, you should see this stuff immediately. And so, you know, I, I, I totally understand why there's a little bit of fear and trepidation when it comes to deception, because that can throw off other internal tools that are, you know, monitoring stuff and watching the environment. And those are good things, but there is nothing that scares me more I, I there is one thing that scares me more that's behavior but there there's nothing like really up there in terms of the fear factor for red team is again making my tools lie to me uh and so that's that is definitely scary so um, and, i mean because you're, you're you're pretty much a, a ones and zeros type of person it's either there or not and if a tool yeah. returns back hey this this credential is valid it's a domain admin account you're going after that right um, I, I i have to test it right i have to test it so. so, so you throw these, you throw these different, you know, things into place that can be, you know, really, really difficult. And I mean, you know, there's different belie- believabilities too. I think, you know, there's, there's things that, you know, especially from a, from an OPSEC perspective that you have to be really careful of, you know, being on the red team, which is like, you know, Hey, if I see an account, does it match up to an AD list that I yep. have? Yep. And is it in a specific group? Is that group something that I need to actually access or that I need access to, or am I going to create some noise by doing this? But if you see an account that's, you know, in a high level privilege account, you know, type of, type of access and you have the credentials for it and you go to use it. I mean, you're going to test that account. Like there's, there's no way around that. Um, and yeah. there's no way to, to really figure that out unless, you know, it's a pre can thing that's, you know, used across all of the different customers or whatever, but you know, really, if it's unique to that environment, it's, it's going to be really difficult to discern the differences. And, you know, you look at attack pass from like bloodhound, for example, and other ones, you know, can you build pass in, into those to, you know, output things like Bloodhound or different t- types of tools to be able to respond back differently so that you have different paths. I mean, there's so much that can go into this from a complexities perspective, and especially, you know, tokens, uh, session IDs, things like that, that you can implant in into different locations, you know, build them into apps, but obviously fake, you know, fake them out. Like, it's really going to be difficult for anybody to really go through that and say, hey, that's not real. That's not. Yeah. yeah. Final last piece on this. We're really big on the realism. We've seen this before. Uh, with defensive tools that are trying to break things like Responder, where the host names that they generate are based off a really strict algorithm that doesn't match the host names in an environment. So um, th- I think the first iteration of Canary Tokens was, you know, the John Smith DA account that's never been logged in or the, the John Smith account with no groups. Uh, people are starting to realize, you know, that might work, work really well for ransomware. Somebody runs a script and walks away. Cool. But like just the next level, putting in, you know, 10% more effort to make it look realistic goes a really long way and will give you more longevity out of the you know canary token approach. Yeah. And, and, and putting, putting that, that same line of, of defense and I think questioning in the heart, there was a, there was a talk that I really enjoyed at wild West hacker fest. I had to, uh, the story at wild West was crazy because I literally, I was planning on wild West is one of my favorite, favorite conferences to go to. I love flying out there. It's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I feel like it keeps like the, the, the riffraff low because you really have to be dedicated to security to, to go out there and really commit to a conference that's like an hour and a half drive or an hour drive, you know, in the middle of, of Deadwood, South Dakota, you know, it's freezing. It's, you know, it's, it's everything that, that people don't necessarily want in a conference and uh, it's perfect. It's the perfect place. John did a great job with that black Hills and everybody else that runs that Bell does amazing. Um, but uh, so this year I was planning on staying for a couple of days. And then I got word that uh, we had a foreign exchange student come that same weekend. So I literally had to like fly in, give my talk. And I only had like 45 minutes before my plane boarded when my talk ended. And it's an hour drive, solid hour drive to get back. And I, I still made it. So it was, so I literally landed, drove an hour, gave my talk. You know, I had like a 30 minute gap in between when I landed an hour and then a the half hour just to hang out. I, you know, got to had a Leslie and a few other folks and, you know, just basically like said hi. And then I got on my stage and I talked for 45 minutes. I put my talk, you know, 10 minutes early 
and then got in my car and then drove back to the airport. I was gunning it on the freeway. I'm not going to say the speed I was because it was not good. <laughs> and uh, finally, finally, was able to catch the flight and get home. And, and you know, everything was fine with with the foreign exchange, exchange student. Uh, in fact, a uh, great kid uh, ended up uh, being an awesome experience. But, um, uh, you know, it's uh, so unfortunately, I didn't get to see the talks live, but I did go back uh, and, and, and take a look and, and watch them. And one of the talks that uh, was there, and I always enjoy uh, Olaf. Uh, he he always has you know just inspiring talks. I mean, just from a defender's perspective. Uh, and his his talk, um, Olaf uh, Hardong, was uh, the truth uh, is out there. Solving the mysteries of lateral movement passed by feeding logs to to the hound. And so it was going through leveraging um, all the integrations between like Sentinel, Defender, uh, Azure Graphs, uh, Neo Four J, uh, and then the Bloodhound API, and basically being able to uh, send all that data through and track sessions, environmental changes, uh, and kind of build out like a whole alert framework, you know, directly through kind of what Bloodhound actually has available. And so I thought it was a creative way of, of looking at, you know, real time kind of analysis instead of just the point in time snapshots that you do, uh, of around, uh, you know, pass to, to victory from, from a red teaming perspective. And it kind of shows you that the better granular logs you have and the focus you have on post exploitation scenarios, the better you're going to have as far as the defender to either a build defenses in preventative defenses or detective you know defenses in place as it goes along and i think that's one one really cool thing that i i think has shifted in this industry over the past you know probably 10 years is that the the focus is less and less on uh stopping all of the methods because that's not possible mm -hmm. but more so mm -hmm. looking at the the methods that are employed after initial access is, is occurred mm -hmm. And then building either defenses, you know, across the, the different phases of an attack, like MITRE attack yeah. framework and spring it out, not, not necessarily the, the techniques, matrix, and, and just signatures, but more so mm -hmm. the behaviors that those exhibit, um, I think has been really, really awesome to see the transformation of cybersecurity through that. And a lot of these talks really focusing on those types of methods instead of the, the righteous zero day hack that's going to get burned at a talk and then patched, you know, the next day, right. it's now more so, you know, how do we focus on new techniques that we need to focus on that are exposures that Microsoft may not fix? Or two, what are the defensive mechanisms that are exhibited by attackers that we can defend or see right now that give us a lot of treasure trove of data that we can start to like get into and actually defend our network? So that's that's been a really cool change to see in a lot of these talks. Yeah, anything Mark no fix is always fun for the red team. You know, we, we like to dive into that stuff. I mean, you, along the lines of uh, defensive talks, uh, I would say probably my my favorite defensive talk that I saw um uh where the last year was probably Koopa's talk also at Zivcon. um he he actually went into defenses for evil jinx and this is another one of those talks where it was it, it's it, it evokes a complicated emotion for me because red team loves evil jinx and it's really one i'm not gonna say it's the only tool that does that because there, there are other tools that you know they do proxying and that kind of thing but his is definitely the best um and by far and there there's really no close second when it comes to sms phishing so um you know he actually went into defensive measures like javascript that you can add to your page that will you know detect evil jinx uh use you know acting as the man in the middle um and then ways to obfuscate that javascript so red teamers have a hard time you know seeing what was done and and like i said on one hand i'm like oh man that's that's just it just hits me right here you know because we we love that tool but on the other hand because of how powerful that that tool is and that that technique in particular, um, you know, Evil Jinx is essentially a category killer when it comes to, um, you know, what what that tool does and, and the technique that it that it's, uh, you know, abusing. And so to see some defensive work coming around that, that's a huge boon for defenders. And so um, I, I don't know, like, I, I don't recall people doing a whole lot of, you know, discussion around it again. Um, and I, I have some other smaller, like lesser known cons that, you know, be good to talk about those as well. Um, but his was, his was a great one in terms of like actually giving practical defense. It's just like insert a little bit of JavaScript into your page and you can see this stuff. Um, and that was, that was really, really good. And I cheated from the defensive side. So I took a, I took an easy win. Um, you know, John Lambert's keynote talk at Blue Hat, um, just because he's a great storyteller and he's been in this space for so long. Yeah. Um, you know, 20 years at Microsoft, you've seen a lot of things, you got a lot of stories. So, um, I, and I also love the fact um, that he has a big appreciation for offense. A lot of times, you know, people like to pit each other against each other, defense versus offense and this. And, uh, you know, John has always been a, a big advocate for offensive testing. Um, we write some different code that we publish out to GitHub that was in C. Um, he's shown up randomly and just issued commits again yeah, to audit yeah. it to make it more secure, which has been a, a really funny thing to watch happen. But yeah, yeah. his big thing is just, you know, breaking down detections. Um, one of the neat things he had was, we were talking about this before the started, 
but uh, hunting on professionalism. So like uh, he gave an example where somebody did air handling and like egg hunter shell code where, you know, somebody randomly learning or, you know, maybe like a lower level person might not do that. But if you're writing this code for a nation state or whatever the other reason is, um, you inherently do things, um, you know, just because you have this level formal. Yeah, you have formal coding techniques that people might not bring in, and that might be a, a tell of who wrote that or who did something. So he just goes through a bunch of different methodologies and different things that they've seen in the past. One of the things that was cool was uh, Microsoft deploying honeypots, where like the first couple times a command runs, it fails, um, kind of trying to aggravate the attacker and get them to like do something that they might not expect to do. And just, just a bunch of different lessons to kind of take away. Um, and I think going back to Jason's key points about talks, just... That, those life lessons and the stories around that make the whole talk, you know, every, every party brings up is, is you learn something new. Before I get into mine, we have a question on the webinar, which is, uh, have you ever attended a talk where the topic was interesting, i.e. learning a new technique or bypass, but you found out it was so niche that you couldn't really apply it on an engagement or in a realistic environment all the time. I would say all the time, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. Something we run into, and I never want to discourage people from giving talks. Like this is always a tough one to talk about, but somebody will give a talk on some technique or red team tool, and then they'll get to the end and be like, "Yeah, I've never actually tried this in production." And we're like, "Okay, like this sounds really great." And we're like, "I don't know if this will work." So I, I love the idea because you know we might make some twist on it or do something to it. Just sometimes it's like I don't know, this is a little off the wall. So um you know that that's always my big thing is you know if if just up front just be like hey i've never tried this in production but i got this off the wall idea it might work for you because we've seen in the talk and we're like well then they list the caveats about why this wouldn't work in production that sort of thing so we're saying is poc or keep in mind. gtfo yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah basically yeah. yeah for sure yeah and, and you know there's been a lot of talks that you know i've seen be more theoretical which are fascinating uh but have never really you know came to fruition or maybe aren't aren't necessarily possible from from what happened before that's why whenever i give any of my talks you know i release you know new new tools uh proof of concepts like the powershell talk we we wrote uh you know it was the, the first iteration of powershell like beta first came out it wasn't even integrated into windows yet and we gave the very first ever powershell security talk me and a buddy named josh kelly and you know we released reverse shells and how to dump lsas you know uh directly from powershell and all of these different you know types of of um you know, techniques that had never been done before, you know, circumventing uh, some some pretty awesome security mechanisms, including the GAC. And, and it was just like a really cool, you know, early discovery, you know, phase that then blew up to what we see from the research, you know, being put into PowerShell today. And then, you know, and I mean, I have tools based on it for like PowerShell Empire and everything else, right? So, you know, it, I think it's important if you're going to be coming out with something new and innovative, one, you should have a POC that explains it, it can walk it through so that people can build off your research. And that's one thing that I found is that, you know, you may have an idea, but somebody, you know, a thousand other people have a lot of other different experiences that may be able to expand and even, you know, enhance and make it, you know, 10,000 times better than what you initially came up with. And some of the talks that, uh, you know, I remember, you know, uh, just even, 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 you know, last year, you know, it's like such a niche thing that, you know, I can't imagine ever being able to, to use it, you know, like uh, uh, at home webcam. Okay. Okay, cool. You know, that's, it, it's cool that you reverse engineered, and found an exploit, a, a zero day in this, which has since been patched, never going to be able to use it again, never going to run into this home webcam, you know, so, so yeah, but cool research, you know, it's cool how you found it and discovered it and kind of tore it apart and figured things out. I think you should definitely share that, but probably not something I might be able to use on a pen test or, you know, anything on, on an engagement anytime soon, right? Definitely. Uh, question uh, from Darren, what are some of the talks that you would recommend for cybersecurity students, talks that they need to see early on? Dave, you're probably a good one for that one. You got any that come to mind? I, I, the, the only thing that comes to mind immediately is anything that describes the journey. So yeah. where people, how, how people got started, why did they make the decisions that they made to get them into cybersecurity? Um, and you know, the, the reason why they chose whatever particular discipline they're in, those kinds of talks are really, really good. So anything that talks about the life story of how they got from A to B, I, I think is good. And Darren, good, good to hear from you, man. Uh, Darren is, uh, runs the the high school cyber program at Bedford High School, so good good to hear, good to hear from you. Uh, you know, I would say you know we we used to have this this track at DerbyCon uh, called New to Infosec, and it was folks that were just getting into Infosec and their kind of story around how they got into cybersecurity. 
Um, there's some uh, some podcasts out there. I think it's like the Cybersecurity Mentors podcast. There's a few other ones out there that kind of talk about it. I did one uh, about how I kind of got into InfoSec, but we talked more so about how newer folks can get into InfoSec because things have obviously changed in the past 25 years, uh, just a little bit um, in cybersecurity, right? Um, and so there's there's some good podcasts out there that you can use as far as like general talks. There are definitely some some good talks out there. Uh, John Hammond had a really good talk at Wild West Hack and Fest, uh, just kind of talking about cybersecurity in general. Uh, and I thought it was really good around, you know, your passion, motivation, uh, how to communicate, uh, those types of things. Uh, so I think it's I think it's on YouTube. Uh, but John John is phenomenal. So and I'd also say, just getting into um, cybersecurity too. John Hammond has a lot of great videos on getting into cybersecurity, some basic topics, everything from, you know, port scanning to taking apart malware to, you know, you name it. Um, there's some some really good, um, you know, people out there doing more of the podcasting, webcasting, TV channel uh, type of stuff that's out there um, that can give you some some good, in, you know, insight into some of the things that are happening out there today, uh, which I think is really good, so. That was gonna be my point too. That I think there used to be a lot of more entry level talks, but with how big YouTube and streaming and everything else has become that, you know, those things are on demand. The specific topic is on demand, just a lot more readily available to go, Hey, I want to learn how to port scan or, Hey, I'm doing a CTF. I need help doing, you know, a basic Linux ASLR bypass or something like that. Like you don't need to go find a talk and go, right. you, know, you can just pull it up right away on the fly. Yep, for sure. And uh, I mean, there's just so many I mean, good channels out there for, for folks. I mean, it's, it's not just, you know, John, I mean, John has some, some really good ones, but I mean, there's so many people doing some, some good, good ones out there. Um, if some kind of names, I'll, I'll, I'll think of those off the, the top of my head, but, um, yeah. Yeah. A couple from my standpoint, um, I, and I talked about, uh, practicality before, um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of talks that follow to a certain degree, a bit of a formula, which is, I mean, they give an explanation, they describe something at a high level, they get really practical with the advice. And then there's like, you know, a demo or something like that. These two talks were great because they scratched all those itches, so to speak. Um, two that I that that I'm looking at, one in B sides Toronto, um, attacking JWT tokens. I, I thought this was really good because it was a talk that was 30 minutes. It was lots of live demo, which I which I thought was fantastic. And by the way, if you're if you're watching this and maybe you got a talk or maybe you're submitting a CFP and you're wondering if you should do a live demo, the answer is yes, you should do a live demo. If you've never done a live demo, you absolutely should. And the reason why I say that, because you might be afraid of, you know, failing or something like that. Live demo trust me. Best. Yes. Yeah, tr trust sure. me when I tell you, if you fail during a demo, it's not how you fail, it's how you recover. And so people are going to learn more watching you fail and then recover and then go so, through it. So I'll tell a story oh, real quick. I didn't want to mention uh, also Lori, Lori Wired has a really good channel, yeah. YouTube channel yeah. um, on reverse engineering. Um, amazing uh, content coming from her as well. So I want to shout out to Lori as well, uh, along with John. But um, my very first talk I ever gave was at DEF CON. Well, let me rephrase it. The first big talk I ever gave was at DEF CON. And I was so nervous, but it was with like five different people and they all had different parts and no one, everybody was out like drinking and I was the only one that was nervous about it. And of course you get there and all the demos F and fail. And it was just, a, it was a disaster. And I look back at that as there's still a song that I can't listen to because it reminds me of that, that talk. <laughs> and, um, and then I, you know, I learned from that and then I went and did ShmooCon. And that's when the whole let's pop a box stuff came up and I had released a tool called fast track and every single demo live demo went perfect. Not one hiccup, everything went exactly the way as anticipated. And then I had another demo I did, uh, I believe it was for, maybe it was for DEF CON again, and it failed right in the middle of the, uh, of the, of the presentation. And I fixed it live on stage and people came up to me afterwards like, dude, I've never seen somebody actually fix the bug live on stage. I'm like, Hey, I knew where it was at. I just had to come and go and figure it out. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, you learn as you go through what you can and kind of, kind of get away with, but I will say like, if you're not really, um, if you're too nervous about doing a live demo, pre-recorded is fine. You know, it's, it's fine. Cause you can kind of walk through it and at your own pace and that type of stuff. But live is definitely a showmanship type of thing where 100%. you're typing on the keyboard and the stuff is flying around. And, you know, the, my, my favorite one still to this day was when we patched, I was working at a fortune 1000 company. And, you know, we patched 10,000 live servers with an SCCM bug. And so I had 10,000 live shells on a production infrastructure and in, in a Fortune 1000 enterprise, you know, behind me, you know, with with a lighter and some heavy metal music going. And I had no <laughs> idea if it was going to work. And nor did I have approval to go and do that. So, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I was definitely pushing the envelope at that time. But, you know, I was comfortable enough with my presentation skills. That I knew if it didn't fit, if it failed, I can, you know, I can get out of it. Right. We did a live social engineer with Kevin Mitnick one time. 
uh, and, uh, you know, was able to get somebody up on stage and, and, you know, hack a box then. So, you know, really cool stuff kind of pushing the envelope. Uh, and you can take it to, to various extremes, you know, with what your comfort level is. For those that might be wondering, the talk that Dave is referring to with uh, the the lighter and stuff that was at DEF CON 20. And it's the, I, I'm a little ashamed to admit, is the only DEF CON I've ever attended. And I was in the audience for that talk. And that's why I was like, I need to go work for this guy. So <laughs> your, 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 your talks. Yeah, I did. It did. <laughs> it was, it was me and uh burner. We were sitting next yeah. to each other. We we're like, this is amazing. Dude, it was, what, it was the penn and teller room. Like 5, oh, yeah. people. Oh yeah. Audience. It was fantastic. It was standing room only. Yeah. You know, it was, go, was go watch that talk. Go own, watch that talk. Own one to rule them all was that yeah. was the name of the talk. I think. Uh, right, and, right, uh, right. Yes. Yeah. And it was, it was, uh, I was, sh- shit in my pants the night before trying to get everything ready beforehand because you know everything fails beforehand and you're like sure. it's not gonna work and yeah. i'm like ah, it'll be fine and you know yeah. finally get up in there and everything went without a hitch so it was so cool yeah that, that was anyway, my, my favorite part was when the, the clapping stopped because the shells just kept going and yeah. then the clapping started again yes yes so many shells going it was yes. it was just great just a great 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 memory i'll never forget that one so yeah and I'm not telling someone just asked what the song was that I can't listen to. And I'm not going to tell you that song because because it'll be played <laughs> just like when, when my, my clown phobia was exposed. It'll be played every time I see somebody and it'll just give me the, you know, like the pit in my stomach of, of me failing every single DEF CON demo. So I'm not telling anybody that one. <laughs> hit, uh, anonymous, just hit me up on Twitter afterwards. I'll let you know. <laughs> 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 All right, we have we have another uh, one. Um, are we seeing any trends that might have come from the recent arrests of multiple infamous ransomware groups? Um, at least I'll start off with you know any type of of post breach data analysis that gets published is very valuable uh, for defenders, right? Because it lets us know it's it's a barometer, right? Are, do we have good coverage and effectiveness over these specific threat actors and what their capabilities are, right? Are they increasing their capabilities thus? circumventing the defenses that we have and our understanding of their capabilities. Um, and then, or, or two, you know, is there new things that are being applied that we need to focus on to get that into our detection program or, or preventative? Um, and so, you know, yeah, absolutely. When we see, you know, groups arrested or we see post-breach analysis where there's a major data breach and then, you know, you have a, a company come in and do IR and then they publish, you know, their findings publicly or through fees or whatever. Um, it gives us an insight into are we doing the right, are we focused on the right things for these actors or are they changing their capabilities to, to get around that, right? And it's really, um, if you look at, at these groups, I think the, the big thing to understand is that it's a time investment thing for them. So it ends up equating to money, right? Everything's money driven for ransomware groups and it's a, a time and effectiveness of money. And so if they're effective with 90% of the customers out there that they're going after, they're still gonna use the same type of capabilities that they did before. They're not gonna shift their tactics to something different. And I think that's the problem that we have in cybersecurity is that, you know, the large enterprises can afford these these big threat intelligence fees and these big detection engineering programs and, you know, the SIMs and the EDRs and everything else and all combined with cloud and everything else. But then, you know, you have medium sized to large sized organizations that, that can't or the programs at a, a relatively immature state. And so, you know, they, they, they have this big gap around when these adversaries release these types of capabilities and we know about them to when it actually gets into their environment, which usually is never um, you know, they usually have a long period of time that they can leverage those types of attacks against an organization. So they don't really have to shift. So yes, it lets us know when the capabilities have shifted to something different. Of course, when we have like big breaches, like the sh- shadow broker stuff with the alleged NSA tool leaks and things like that, you know, that is, you know, once in a lifetime historical type things that we typically see out there from a cash perspective, and that takes a lot of time to digest and kind of, you know, build in, but that burns all those capabilities. But most of the time, you know, it's it's minor tweaks or obfuscation or new tools they may be leveraging or new C2 that's out um, that they switch to that that is the area of focus. So definitely valuable for sure. Questions about uh, uh, conferences, would you recommend? I'll, I'll, I'll take one of those. What conference do you recommend for someone just starting out? Um, I what I would say there is whatever is local. Yeah, and B-sides, there, like, yeah. like a local B-sides, yeah. Oh, and so like, like where I live, uh, you know, Northern Midwest, uh, some of my, my best friends in, in InfoSec that I still meet with to this day that I've known for 10 years, I come from a local InfoSec group and I've done work with them. They've done work with us. And it's like having a local support community is extraordinarily important. So even just getting involved in like the smallest of groups, there's like 10 people that get together and discuss InfoSec that is going to pay dividends for, you know, not, not just your knowledge, but also your career. But uh, what would you guys say for um, for conferences like in a, in a larger venue, like maybe break it down United States versus, say, Europe? 
if you had to pick one to go to in either. I mean, I've always enjoyed Brucon and like, you know, those types of uh, Hack Hackon in, in Norway is always a, a phenomenal one. Um, you know, it's what's interesting about I, I think it's different with the European versus US talks. Mm -hmm. is that the European talks technically very, very much focus on the technical components, right? You have some yep. really great technical talks out there. Yep. Um, I was really surprised, you know, you, you think, you know, Europe behind the United States in many, many cases on, on technical process, it's not the case, you know, they have amazing researchers. Um, their talks are, are, are absolutely brilliant. Uh, they, they're focusing on the right stuff. Um, here in the United States, you know, for, for new to come ones, um, there's one in Augusta, Georgia, it's security on onion conference was really yep. good. And then yep. right after the security onion con, they have B sides Augusta. Uh, which is fairly large. I think they got like a thousand people or something there. Um, so two two really good talks kind of are cons back to back uh, that are good for new to folks. We also have a question from 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 Sanford here around uh, what conferences would you recommend, preferably by knowledge level of new new to security to experts. So go, going into that theme of, you know, more so on the highly technical versus non technical. I would say Wild West Hacking Fest is a good blend uh, of that. Right, you have kind of new to InfoSec talks, as well as, you know, new stuff. Like one of the talks I was going to talk about was Graph Runner um, that uh, Bo and Steve Borish, uh, Bo Bullock um, and Steve Borish uh, put together, uh, Graph Runner using the, the Graph APIs for post-exploitation. Uh, you know, like like new tool release, new code, awesome. They, they present amazing, great talk. You know, you get those types of talks there. Uh, so Wild West has become one of my favorite ones. You have um, uh, the one out of uh, uh, New Orleans. Um, Nolicon? Nolicon, yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, Nolicon is awesome. Good blend of of both, I think, in in those conferences. Um, you know, there's there's some some really good ones out there for sure. Uh, I mean, European. I, I, well, sorry, just not real quick. I, I was no. thinking Troopers. Uh, the one Troopers is one of the best conferences I think I've ever attended in terms of like raw technical talks. I mean, you got the who's who, you know, of the European infosec scene, and that was that was fantastic. Um, and then U.S. I I I'm a little ashamed to admit I've never been to Wild West. That is, it is on my list, but I, I would love to go. So um, I've, you and everyone else has just, you know, praised that conference to, you know, to the high heavens. And so uh, it, I, I heartily recommend that one, you know, if, if travel is in, uh, uh, in the budget there. Sorry, Justin. No, I was just going to add on like the high end, like experience ones, like CanSec West, like Recon, like there's some conferences that are still all about like exploit dev and crazy reverse engineering. Like if you want to take things in that direction, you can, the local B sides, Denver's Point, entry level. Um, you do get some bigger speakers that jump around. Um, I'm always an advocate for going to DEF CON at least once, um, just for the experience. Uh, you know, you get to Vegas, you get to meet a bunch of people. Um, Scott, and Scott I'm also Ethington had, had posted in there like, uh, I haven't heard DEF CON come up as a recommendation, any feedback there. And you know, I, th I think, like you mentioned, it's it's great to go there once and kind of get the experience. It's it's definitely different than than what it was before, and just recognizing that it's more of a cosplay than it is anything else. It's kind of like the the infosec cosplay uh, type of place. You have a lot of you know hacker culture there, which I think is really cool. Um, a lot of big graphics and designs and things, and they have um, their workshops are pretty cool. The individual like you know uh, red red teaming you know workshops, and you know they have uh, where you can reverse engineer and disassemble like cars and get on CAN bus and do exploitation that way. So I think there's a lot of good carve out workshops that you can go to. Um, you know, that that are more beneficial than probably the conference itself. I, I just find that dealing with, you know, 20,000, 30,000 people at such a large venue is overwhelming. And it's very difficult. So somebody coming into cybersecurity going to DEF CON is going to be lost like hell. They're not going to know anybody. It's just too vast. And I, I'm throwing around like a, a, a you know, like, like a wildfire across the board every time I, um, you know, have to um, go to DEF CON. So I, I haven't, uh, you know, attended DEF CON probably in four or five years uh, just because it's been, you know, such a, a large one. Um, Black Hat is 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 great. I do like Black Hat. I think it's big, but it's small enough that you can still go to the individual talks and, and enjoy some some things. Um, RSA tends to be a much more higher level one, just like like DEF CON, I would say. You know, it's like everybody says, like, you know, RSA is the new or, or the new the, the new RSA is DEF CON, you know, blah, 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 whatever. I, it, whatever. It's fine. Whatever you per personally prefer, if you like those higher level talks, you know, more businessy cybersecurity focused RSAs, you know, definitely good for that. And they do have some technical talks there too. So I'm not, not discouraging those. Um, I've, I've spoken at RSA. I've been to RSA. I don't want to ever go to RSA ever again. Um, you know, uh, it's just too big, you know, again, nothing that, that they're not doing wrong. It's a great conference. It's just way too big. Um, and you don't learn a lot of things in my opinion, when you go to those, those types of, of, of conferences. So, you know, again, good, good for those, uh, but not, and uh, you know, 
DerbyCon, yeah, someone someone mentioned DerbyCon. You know, DerbyCon obviously was was a, a conference that we started and you know did really great of bringing new folks in and you know you know high level. You know, I would say some of the, the best talks. I mean, lol bins were discovered there and. You know, I mean, Tim Medine, I think, did Kerber roasting there. And I mean, it's just some of the, you know, high speed stuff that we still use today, you know, all came from, yeah. from Derby Count. So definitely, definitely agree with you there. Justin, what was your best Perfect. talk? What was your favorite? So I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use two just because they're, they're completely on different ends of the spectrum. Um, so the operation triangulation talk um, from uh, uh, whatever the conference is in Germany. <laughs> Troopers? No, no, uh, CCC. Oh, I, I haven't seen that. So, one yet. so, so they, so they basically, it was people from Kaspersky got hacked by somebody, and they're and they basically they walk through all of the forensics they did on the iPhone, and I think that the reason I like that talk is because everybody talks about APTs and they throw that term around, and depending on where you sit, that means a lot of things to a lot of people. It's, it, it's a good reminder that there's still people out there doing off the wall things you couldn't even comprehend, right? Like people who do ransomware are using, you know, WMI and you kind of understand the, the blocks within they, you know, what they sit in and what they do. But then you can still get your mind blown by attack chains that are like that, um, just haven't been seen before. And the other one I want to shout out for probably one of the, the better best ones is um, hacking the cloud like an APT. Um, so Lena gave this talk um, and it basically just walks through modern defenders and modern offense and what you have to deal with in the cloud like jwt tokens and basically just um you know breaking down assumptions about like what you need to do to attack and defend um, a lot of blue teams just weren't ready to do incident response there you know other people don't realize you know you may need to pen test this you may need to harden it you need a plan to respond um and it just walks through end-to-end -end common attacks things that have been seen in the wild and i i think that it opens up people's eyes to you know there's a whole new attack surface here we need to rethink you know testing, securing, building all of those pieces. Uh, just something that isn't talked about enough. Well, it's I'm incredible. a little biased on this one again, but uh, Drew Kirkpatrick's talk and blog on JS Tap, I thought was really good. Um, so, you know, being able to uh, implant malicious JavaScript into something that has like cross-site scripting, for example, from an application and being able to use that as essentially a, a relay to harvest information from people and to you know do further post-exploitation, I thought was really cool. So leveraging... Um, you know, iframe traps to to basically, you know, control whoever visits that site and and kind of their 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 information that you can you know glean from that and everything else, which is kind of cool. I think my favorites, um, uh, it was DefCon, and th this one was from Sturk. And he, I I'm a terminal nerd, and so anytime I see you talk about a terminal, I have to watch it. And there was he gave a talk that just that just hit all the right spots, had all the stories, the practicality. And that was weaponizing plain text and the escape sequences as a forensic nightmare. And that was like watching somebody run a curl command and then calc pop up on the on their screen because of an ANSI escape sequence. That's that's really exciting and really terrifying at the same time. And then he he referenced another talk that was at Blue Hat, which is Houdini of the terminal. And David, uh, I think it's either lead beater or lead beater, he he went through six different CVEs on on stage and like did these various talks or did, did these various demos about how he's getting you know uh, rce and that kind of stuff you know just through uh terminal escape sequences and seeing that kind of stuff oh my gosh i was like that's so i, I can just i can pollute my logs now and then have some poor defender you know that's trying to investigate my server come by and like scrape the log and then bam i can get code execution on their box that's actually it's kind of sexy it's awesome we we have a question. Uh, any good hardware uh, projects, cool security hardware gadgets, or projects that were released? Oh, I mean the one that's making that's been making the rounds on the internet is Flipper, um, but that's a little little outside my space. LZ, you got any good ones there? Not really. I like I said, I I tend to focus on offense, CTI, and malware. It's basically where I live for talks. Um, like Dave mentioned, you know, somebody will always break some webcam or something like that. There's been a lot of um, flipper stuff. And I think the the nice thing about the flipper is it kind of opens up the SDR space to a whole new group, yeah. right? Before yeah. you had to buy a dedicated SDR, or look at some software. At least now you can get in at a, you know, a little bit easier clip and do that. But I don't have any off the top of my head. There was uh, last year that one of the most like groundbreaking iPhone hacks came out, which Kaspersky 
alluded to came from, you know, nation state that happened to be the United States. But um, it was four specific zero days chain to get, you know, full remote code execution on a system. And it was probably one of the, one of the best ones I think I've ever seen uh, apply to to iPhone. It was a combination of like a font parser flaw, a flaw, an integer overflow, memory corruption flaw, uh, and a kernel uh, flaw that, you know, that allowed, you know, for full remote code execution. So it was like four different exploits chained into one. And that's what we saw with the same thing with like Hafnium, for example. You know, it was like six different exploits chained to get remote code execution on on-prem exchange servers. So not just one, you know, master buffer overflow that gives you full access to the box. It's, you know, combination of like cross-site scripting and SQL injection that allows command execution that allows you to then, you know, you know, do something different. So, you know, I think the chaining of exploit ones where they're, they're really brilliantly crafted uh, and they chain a number of different techniques together. Those are some of my favorite ones to watch because it's like the amount of research and time and effort yeah. and persistence and dead ends. Yeah. that they had to produce is is astronomical to get to that point. And then, you know, obviously when you see four pretty intense zero days uh, burned, you know, those those are now gone forever, right? You're not, you can't use those anymore. Uh, so yeah, I think that was a, a one of my fun ones from last year uh, was was the the iPhone hack. Was, was there one. talk about that? Did I, did I miss that? No, I, it what? was, so the, the CCC one, the Operation Triangulation oh, one. The, the, that's the, the one you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The, uh, I got one more from DEF CON too, I thought of as an honorable mention. So it's the art of uh, compromising C2 servers uh, from web app loans. So basically um, the person giving the talk went through and popped a bunch of councils for different um, malware. So SQL injection, things like that, uh, token issues. And I think that's a good reminder to anybody out there on the red team space, like writing C2 is writing things that are gonna get probed by people. Uh, you know, You have to think about security in your offensive products. Uh, even if they're internal tools and things like that, I just I think that you know hammering that concept home that if that lands on the internet, somebody somewhere might try to find a way to break into it. More so if they get the source code, um, and just kind of driving that point home by showing a bunch of demos for people. Just uh, that side of things isn't talked about. People will you know fire off POCs, or they'll fire off my you know my first C two, and they'll put it on the internet. Somebody will use it, uh, but oftentimes those contain flaws or things like that that could get abused. And the worst thing you want to happen is some actual threat actor riding on your coattails of a you know an actual engagement yeah it was funny I, I just just recently i there was a reverse engineer that that uh took apart some code it was this like really elaborate you know with like you know uh just going through and disassembling this attack and it was all magic unicorn which is the tool that i'd written and you know but it, the way that they reversed it was, is completely different from how i would reverse it because obviously i know how the whole thing works so, you know, it, it, watching the stages that somebody went through to to tear apart my own tool and finally find the shell code and piece together the shell code and figure out the shell code was doing, you know, it was it was really cool to watch like a, a completely different approach from like a malware reverser going after my tool than, you know, somebody that just hacks stuff together to get it to work. Right. And, um, you know, so that was kind of interesting this year. That happened recently, it was like a month ago. And I, and I responded back to the person on social media. I'm like, hey, that's my tool, Magic Unicorn. And he's like, oh, really? You know, you have a link to it. I'm like, here it is. And he's like, oh, this could have been a lot easier for me to reverse than having to go through all this. But, you know, it's really cool to see the stages yeah. of, of yeah. you know, somebody going through your tools. And obviously you don't want to see, you know, ABT groups using using your tools. Uh, that, that sucks. But you know, at the same time, defenders need to have the same tools as, you know, the folks that are out there um, doing the bad stuff. So for sure. Well, we're wrapping up on time. If anybody has any questions, feel free to pop them in. Um, but, uh, you know, I think 2023 was... You know, I always get worried that we've hit a certain plateau, uh, you know, with with talks and techniques. And there's no question, you know, you, Jason, you kind of alluded to it on, on the, the fact that whenever you see a new like red team technique burned, you know, you, you kind of you kind of die a little bit inside. You know, it, there, it's true that that the techniques that we leverage on a regular basis, we kind of keep close to chess because they are, you know, techniques. Um, and and we don't want to burn those because then they're gone and we can't use them, you know, again in the future. At the same time, it's healthy for those that eventually come out and and you know for new techniques to be discovered and you know for for ways for us to to innovate and continue to innovate on that side as attackers will um, as well. I remember the the my, my favorite one was the persistence you know internal tool that we had for Outlook, you know that that got burned uh, by Mandiant uh, and you know gave us a classification and did a whole blog post. I was it was Mandiant right or is it? Yeah yeah well, yes FireEye yeah yeah FireEye Fire, Fire, yeah we we we'd used it for years and they they uh -huh. figured out there was a a CVE that um, that Microsoft fixed, and we figured out a way to get around that CVE and still get code execution through Outlook. 
And uh, we've been using it for a long time. And then FireEye snagged it and then did a big blog post on it and gave us credits for it, which is mm -hmm. cool. But we've been using that technique for, you know, and built tools around it and everything else. And we've been using that for years and, you know, burned it, which which definitely definitely hurt a little bit. But, uh, you know, we have other things that are better than that now, so it doesn't matter. But, um, you know, it's, it's those types of things that I think makes this industry a lot of fun. And I think 2023 was a really great year um, for research, for new things coming out. And what I thought was really interesting to, to point out was uh, the focus uh, on cloud cloud uh, mm -hmm. in general. And I think we have been slacking on that quite a bit. And I think you'd see a lot of adversaries like Russia and everybody else has been focusing on cloud for, for quite a long time. To see the research industry really start to catch up and Durkion has always been doing it for years and yeah, been touting yeah. about it. But you know, you you look at you look at uh where the industry is really focusing on, and it is post-exploitation. You know, Melvin had the, the trifecta blog, um, you know, the Triforce blog, whatever the hell it was, the Zelda thing. Uh, and uh, you know, but but the 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 focus on post-exploitation, I think, is is really cool. And um you know, something that we need to continue to focus on is is continuing to do research in the industry. Yeah. It it would be neat if Trusted Sec happened to release anything related to that in 2024. I, it may or may not be happening, but who knows? We I shall mean, see. Who knows? Crazy, wild. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, a couple of questions came in. Uh, how much time do you? How much time do you guys spend a week researching, learning new stuff, just to keep your <laughs> skills up? Oh boy, uh, that's a that's a really hard question. Um, the answer is never enough time, um, just because of the rate of how fast things are changing and tools and techniques and all that are constantly coming out um, on Twitter. And it's always been that way. I mean, InfoSec has always been just a fire hose of information and you can never consume enough. So, right. um, you know, the truth is I rely a lot on my team. They rely on each other. Um, you know, we rely a lot on our, on our, our, our Twitter. We, Trust Tech actually has a Twitter or curator um, that actually reads all of Twitter all day long and gives us the most pertinent things. Um, and so that's actually Justin Elzey on this call. So he, he's basically a Twitter backup. So really hit him up for anything. Uh, Justin, at all Justin is my, my direct feed of yep. everything that's going on. I'll get a, I'll get a yeah. text message at like 12 o'clock at night that I'm like sleeping yeah. and I wake up the next morning. I'm like, Oh, I need to focus on this. Okay. Got it. Can, can we release that as a service like LZTI? Can we do LZ that as a service? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we do that? Like thread and can, can, you know, like, can he handle the help desk tickets too? Because I know he loves those. Well, I mean, obviously, like he's like, <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I mean, to to answer that question, I mean, I spend a lot of time. Like, so I I use I use Reddit, Twitter, and a couple other feeds, and I try to distill those things. The the thing is, everything moves so fast these days. I like to do it because. Um, breach information comes out or an emerging event happens like uh, the VPN thing this week. Um, you know, we can get ahead of that with proof of concepts, writing detections, things like that. So it's, it's almost necessary these days to just stay ahead of those things. Everything moves so fast. POC drops or some news drops and everybody's exploited within 24, 48 hours. So you have to have a plan in place. What's nice is, is how we've kind of architected things here at Trusted Tech. We have so many different groups that focus on different areas of security. So you know, when something hits, you know, you have a defensive team that's working on the detections to get it out to customers. You have a team that's working on the offensive components of getting a POC and be able to write the exploit. You know, we have a research team that's sitting there figuring out, you know, the ins and outs of it to be able to get that in our tooling. So, you know, like all of these cogs kind of working together. And then you have Carlos that is kind of the voice of getting information out to the industry and doing his, his videos and blogs and, you know, explaining what's actually occurring. So, you know, we have a really great team that focuses on kind of the, the wide breadth of different areas that we've never been able to have before, really, you know, just being kind of a smaller size company. And so since we've grown, being able to have those those niches and being able to kind of come together uh, when those happen. One of my favorite ones was the the Citrix one where, you know, we all kind of came together and built the Citrix tool. And, you know, it was funny because I was working on writing the code uh, as it came out and then Rob Simon released his and I was like, I'm using mine instead. I'm the boss. I can take, I mean, you're going to use mine, you know, like, you know <laughs> both write consecutive tools at the same time. I did beat them though. Um <laughs> Although Rob's way smarter than I am, uh, but uh, I think we use most of Rob's code. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it's cool having a team to be able to continuously get this out to the public and to everybody else. But uh, with that, um, thank you all so much for for tuning in today. And obviously, this will be recorded. Um, all the links to all of the talks that we talked about is on the initial link that you registered for, uh, as well as uh, we'll make sure it's on our it's on our website as well. If you go to um, our resources slash webinars section. Uh, all of the links to to all of the talks that we talked about and things like that are, are all up in there. So again, trying to get you know the right information out to you folks and hopefully uh, you know helped you out for some of the amazing talks of 2023. And kudos to the amazing researchers and the people that did present you know last year 
Um, sure. You folks are amazing and you continue to do amazing work uh, in the industry and continue to drive it forward. So we we really appreciate you here uh, at Trusted Sex. So uh, with that, any parting words, Jason, Justin? Squared away. I think you said it all, Justin. Yeah, I think we're all good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for Thank this, this, this special webinar and uh, a lot more coming from us soon. Thanks, everybody. Take care. See ya. Bye.